Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies, a podcast about people sharing extraordinary stories about how music has impacted their lives. Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies. I'm your host today, Annette Smith, and we have a special guest today, international singer, award-winning songwriter, filmmaker, the beautiful and talented Kim Cameron. Welcome to the show, Kim. Hello, so good to be here. Yeah, I'm excited. You're all the way from Miami, and I was in Miami probably six, six, seven years ago. It's probably one of my favorite places to be. Right. I walked that that beach, the Miami Beach, and I thought I was gonna die. I found muscles that I never knew I even have walking in that sand for like five hours, I felt, but it was amazing. I so want to go back. So you're lucky to live out there on the beach and enjoy the scenery every single world. I you know it's very addictive. I I can't complain. Um it's uh it's a wonderful feeling and very inspirational for me. I'm a very much of a nature outdoor person. So a lot of my uh songs really reflect where I live. Um, when I first moved out here about, I guess about seven years ago, um, or I guess it's about seven and a half years ago, I um, wrote an album called Naturally Yours. And every single song had a nature related theme into it because I was just like, oh my gosh, I've, I've found my my home, my like real home, my, my promised land. And uh, so it's, it's, it continues to be very, very reflective in my work. I love it. Where did, where were you before Miami? I lived in DC for a little while before that I lived in Baltimore. I lived in California. I've lived in the Midwest. So I've kind of bopped around all over the place. Um, never in the South. I mean, this is not necessarily considered the South, but we are South. And that's probably the only area I haven't lived in yet. So um, <laughs> have you ever been to Canada before? I've been to Canada many times. I have very good friends who are in Toronto. Nice. Awesome. What was your experience, Kim, putting your playlist together for me today? Um, you know, I was trying to do something that was fun, uh, that reflects summer and, and when you're at a pool parties and you want to find a new summer romance, but you want to be able to dance. So that was kind of where I was, my head was thinking. I love it. So I know that you've hit two billboard chart topping. What was that experience just going through all of that, knowing that so many people are listening to your music, you're moving up the charts. Were you just floored or were you like, oh yeah, totally. Of course I am. That makes sense. Um, you know, when I hit billboard, I didn't at the time, well, I was super excited and surprised. I didn't at the time realize how hard it really is to hit Billboard. And I learned about that later. Um, but at the time, I think I underappreciated the magnitude of what that really meant. And you know, now with um, them, the clubs just getting back, you know, they don't even have that chart anymore that was, you know, monitoring what was going on in the club. So it's, it's, you know, even more of a precious kind of commodity. Um, but it was, it was a very, um, it, it, it opened up a lot of doors for me afterwards. I would say that good two years, I, I was really, um, pleasantly surprised of how significant that was to the industry. What was it like? Do you remember what it was like hearing your first song on the radio? Like, do you remember where you were? Yeah, I do. I was in, I was in um, Louisiana, right outside of New Orleans. We were on tour and I was going, um, I had, was asked to do a radio interview and we were in the car, we were on our way and all of a sudden it came on and we, I wasn't really listening for it. And, but I said, wait, I know that song. So that was a wild, uh, that was a, a really wild experience. I mean, obviously I had heard it on radio stations when I arrived at the radio station, they play it when I was there, but it's, it's another thing when you're not actually, you know, pre-planned and, and it comes on. That was, that was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Where you like, kind of like, like giddy and like, Oh my God, 
I'm so excited. Were, was there people around you experiencing that or was it? My, my whole band was with me. Yeah. So, um, you know, they were like, oh, isn't that your song? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I love it. I, I couldn't even imagine being able to just be an experience like that where you're driving down the car, you know, when your song comes on the radio and you get to experience that, like what a feeling, regardless if you ever made it huge, you know, like selling out stadiums, I think that experience would be something that I would love to experience. It, it's, it's a great feeling. I would say I had, um, I got to relive that feeling, um, about when was it probably four years ago in an odd place and which was made me very happy. I was, we'd stop to get gas and you know how like on seven 11 gas stations, they play the music while you're yeah. pumping your gas. And all of a sudden I was like, wow that really sounds like my song. I listened a little bit more. Uh, it is my song. So we, I had for, I, I think they still do, um, for a number of songs in the last album, uh, Dunkin' Donuts and, and their radio station, which kind of like hits, um, hair cuttery and, uh, Home Depot and, you know, um, 7-Eleven, all those kinds of stores, they, they have their own radio station. I had been plugged in there with a number of my songs. So it would, that was a kind of a, you know, it's one thing on the radio, but then you're, you know, you're getting gas or you're getting groceries and all the songs are on the radio. So that was a little surprising. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. We're going to play your first song. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. So love story. Tell oh, me yes. about what that song means, memory, story behind it. Well, I'm I'm known as a hopeless romantic writer. So I would say I have, you know, 90%, maybe 85% of my songs are love stories. And you know, it, it's kind of different phases of of love. This one is, you know, a woman who's already had a number of loves and she's looking for the last one like she just wants to, to close she's she's tired of going through all these relationships and so she just wants one more love story and that's it like she that's just write it let's let's grow old let's just stop the other you know trying other people out and so um it was it, that was kind of my inspiration behind it and how all of us kind of we all have these different chapters in our lives. And as you get older, those chapters get longer and more complicated. And I, I just thought, well, you know, we all have these, these books that are inside of us. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just close that side of it and then open up the second half and say, well, this one's just, just about us. And we don't need to worry about all the others. Yeah, I agree. I wish life was like that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How come they keep coming up when you don't want them to come up anymore? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you fell in love? Well, gosh, that must have been in second grade. He was such a cute boy and he sat right next to, a, to me. I don't, you know, at the second grade boys, I don't think they know what that is. But when you're a second grade girl, I think you always think you're in love because we read you know, Sleeping Beauty and, and all of the Disney favorites. And, and of course you fall in love at second grade. <laughs> That's so funny. Cause if you, if he wouldn't know now, right. If you were sharing this story with him, he'd be like, oh, I just thought you were, you know, just reading a book with me, but with women we're like, no, nope. it was like, I remember the book. I remember what you were wearing. I remember how I felt. You guys are so stupid that way. <laughs> What were you like growing up in, in high school? Yeah, in high school, wow. Um, I was always into music. So I was, I had a little um, garage, really bad uh, cover band um, that, you know, went into after college and stuff like that. We played at bars and, and we actually had this big following. And, and let me tell you, we were a terrible cover band. We were awful, but 
people are so forgiving for covers, right? Because it doesn't matter how badly you butcher a song, if they can somewhat piece together what you're doing, they'll all sing and be happy. And as you know, you turn up the loud guitars and everybody is good. So we were, we were highly successful in the sense that for a just silly cover band, we would show up a place and we would pack them in and, and have a great night. Um, so I was always into music. I even started out as a clarinet player um, in marching band and orchestra. So I've always been, you know, since I can remember playing around in music one, you know, where or, or the other. And in high school, <clears throat> instead of taking the route of being a cheerleader or uh, pom-poms or something like that, I went into um, more of the seriousness of besides, you know, the, the theater side and the music side, I also was into like the speech and debate side. So I was always oh. into being on some kind of presentation or, or stage. That was kind of where I lived. I was most com comfortable being there. Yeah. What was your band name? Oh, wow. That's a, um, I want to say it was called connections. Oh, but I'd have to think about that. I mean, I, and then we had a, a totally different band in, in, um, after college and wow, I'm sure we called ourselves something stupid, but I can't think of the name right now. What was your favorite cover song to sing? Oh, we had this cover song um that was it it was a, a pep and a guitar song that she didn't sing that often and i loved it and boy that's a great question you're escaping you're making me really think about that one <laughs> but that was uh th there was there were two female um uh, cover songs that i really really enjoyed and I know Pat Benatar was one of them. And the other one was, um, heart, heart oh, yeah. had the song that was called, um, two called two hearts. I believe that was the name. And again, not, it was, it was popular, but it wasn't like, you know, people automatically knew it, but it was just a really great song. They had written some great song, great lyrics, and had these great crescendos. And so the lead guitarist, who was my best friend, he would just know how to wail on the guitar and walk around. And again, we were a really bad cover band, but we had our moments. <laughs> so is it the same on the girl side singer side as it is on the guy singers you get like lots of guys you know coming up to you and potentially wanting to date you or go out or take you out oh for sure yeah I mean it's that's as soon as you go on stage you become better looking than you really are <laughs> you become more interesting better looking everything I mean um it, it's it and I find myself the very same way when I go see some great concerts I'm like wow he's so hot but you know reality if you look at their pictures and you kind of oh I didn't realize he was five two or whatever you know <laughs> but it, just it, it there's something there's something that happens when people get on stage they just become a different you know person they get they become a different person themselves and they appear to be a different person to everybody in the audience yeah have you ever had a, a male stalker or a female stalker I had one male no I had a couple of male stalkers um and that was a little weird uh one of them when I had a uh an ongoing gig. Um, I had a residency up in New York city in, in Soho and that one got a little weird. He would show up and then not say he was showing up. And then later say, I saw you, I was on the bat. I mean, it was a little like creepy stuff. And yeah. So, um, yeah, everybody has a stalker here and there and it's, and, and the, when they're very recluse like that, those are like the scary ones. Yeah. So do you do all like your bouncer or like the whole management team knows what's going on. Yeah. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And they, they put, you know, they watch. They, and yeah. especially my band members at the time, they were very pr protective of me. So that was, I never felt any danger, but it was just like, I, you know, it's creepy. It's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it's creepy. Have you had like a really memorable moment with a fan before? 
Oh, I've had many memorable moments. I mean, um, probably the most significant was when I was in um, St. Bart's. I was on tour for about a month. And during uh, the, in between one of my sets, a little girl, she must have been, oh, I don't know, like nine, 10 years old. And we struck up this conversation and, and she was with her family and uh, she started to tell me her favorite sea life character or creature was an octopus. And it struck me as very, very odd because when you think of little girls, you think their favorite would be a dolphin, maybe a whale, maybe, um, you know, a starfish. Yeah, mermaid, something. Something, but not those like weird looking jelly fish <laughs> octopus, right? So my guitar player and I, the next day wrote this song called Mr. Octopus, just like a tongue in cheek and played it the next night as a goofy thing because we knew the little girl was gonna show up and then everything was about the octopus. Anyway, um, when we got off a tour, my guitar player said, you know, you ought to do something. Um, you, ought, you ought to write a story around this song. And I said, huh, hadn't thought about that, but yeah, sure. So I wrote this story and it ended up being called Seeper Powers in Search of Blue Jay's Treasure. And uh, it became part of a book series that I um, have out. So it's now five books strong. And I took the first book and made it into an animation feature film. So that is my most memorable fan because she just sort of launched everything um, into another direction for me. Wow. <laughs> Where are this? Oh, I no, I'm sure not because I, I wouldn't know her name or, or anything yeah. like that. That's an incredible story. Wow. It'd be really cool to find her and be like, this is kind of what you help me achieve, right? Like, yes, it would be. Give me inspiration to go and do this. Yeah, it would be. It'd be very fun. You have a favorite audience so far in your career, some place that you've played that it was just unreal. Um, I mean, there, there are quite a few great places I've played. I would say the, um, the audience in China was quite interesting. It wasn't my what I'd say favorite audience, but most interesting audience, because the Chinese are very reserved. It's actually improper for them to do anything more than sit and listen and only clap at the end. You know, now I do dance music. So having somebody sit and, and this was about 10,000 people. So having 10,000 people just sit to my music, you know, but they had warned me that this is the Chinese culture and not to expect anything because that would be frowned upon if they got up and wanted to move or anything like that. So I found them very, very, um, very attentive and interesting. And then when I asked them to help me sing one of the songs, which you have to understand the Chinese uh, where I sang was in Shaman, which is South. Um, <clears throat> and so you didn't have a lot of English speaking going on there. So getting them to sing a few English words I mean, it was just, it was just priceless and they all did it because that's what they will. They will, if you're, if they're instructed to sing along, they will do it. So I had like 10,000 people singing, you know, a couple of words back in my own song during the song. And, and it, it, that was, it was quite special. It was quite special. Um, even though that was a, a very different culture. Yeah. Uh, that would be very different. Yeah. But on the other hand, when I was performing, at um, the Dubrov Dubrovnik um, Wave Festival. This is a bunch of Europeans, right? And Europeans, doesn't matter what song you're playing. It doesn't matter if they know the song. I mean, they're up, they're dancing, they don't care. And so they have such energy and to be around that energy is very exciting because uh, it's, you can't not move with them. If you weren't moving, you're gonna move because that's just who they are. And so it, you know, the audiences are, um, there are a lot of things depend on the culture. And so it's fun to see those differences as, as I've gone around the world. Yeah. It's quite a, a career you've had just being able to travel around the world. Yeah. It's right. been a blessing. I've been really, really lucky. I'm excited to play your next song. Ready? Mm-hmm. 
Sounds like another love song. Love it sick. is another, yeah, love yeah. sick. It is another <laughs> love song. Now, the, the motivation behind this one is kind of um, a little different. I, um, I unfortunately, like everybody else in the world, got COVID at, at Christmas. And so uh, I was out two weeks, super sick. But when, when you don't have anything to do for two weeks, you start thinking about things. And I started thinking about, you know, some of these really ill feelings are not so dissimilar to something when you first fall in love. So I've just married the two. So people really listen to the lyrics. It's really about somebody who was getting over COVID, but um, in, in tr my true traditional self, I kept it very much like a love song. I love it. Who would be somebody that you would love to collaborate with on a project? Oh, well, you know, um, black coffee. Oh, I, I think he's got an amazing sound. Um, that would be a dream come true to be able to do a collaboration with him. Do you have people that, um, really stand out for you or influence you as an artist, especially in the dance world? Like it's all over the place, right? You can mix and mash so much stuff together is there certain djs instrumentalists that you're like oh i really love their sound i want to implement that because i feel like with dance music you can right you can yeah steal, I mean, steal each other's stuff but you can in the dance world in a sense it feels like that yeah i think that's true and um one thing that's great about the dance world is we've got these We've got a couple of, you know, a handful of, of great dance conferences where all of us get together and really share music. Um, and one takes place in Amsterdam, one takes place in Ibiza. Um, and then I think they, and then the other one, obviously in Miami. And what is amazing about that is you, you have all these very famous and people just starting up and people who've been around for a long time, they all gather together and they really listen to each other. Like they really, they really want to, oh, oh, I hadn't heard that. Oh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, that's a really good idea. You know, so you get this, um, this sense of their, of not only respect for each other's sound, but the genuine interest. And so I've been lucky to collaborate with so many of these, you know, some, very well known and some not so known, um, but they all have, they're all artists. And so they all have their own unique sound. I mean, it's, there are no two DJs and there are no two producers that sound alike. I mean, they, they really are unique. And so it's, it's fun because it, it kind of, now for me, I'm, I'm much more partial to a deep house sound, yeah, but I but also I like house music. Um, but I also just am, am releasing my first um, Amium Piano just because that particular song I wrote lend itself to that new genre and it's fun. Um, so it's always fun to take it a different direction. It's maybe not always the, the first go to or what, you know, if I want to listen to music, what I like to listen to first. But I think it's good to challenge yourself because you become a better artist if you do. And especially in the world of dance, because it's, you know, beat on repeat. And so you've got to really do that, that extra step to make sure you're staying fresh. Yeah. And I think, and I, and I don't know, cause obviously I'm not in that realm, but I feel like you'd be able to explore so much. It's not like you could take a heavy metal band who becomes famous and then they go on tour and they're singing all country songs. Like that would be devastating. But I feel with dance music, you can really, really explore a whole bunch. You could do some house, you could do some trance, you could do all of this kind of different stuff. And I don't know if you would really lose your following that much because they like dance music, right? They just, like you yeah, said. I think there's, there's a lot of crossover. Um, there definitely are some purists. I mean, when you get into, especially the world of techno, 
people who love techno, they stay in their techno space. And while they'll listen to other stuff, you can see. But I would say that's generally true, that there's um, quite a bit of, you know, fans that will they'll sway across the board. And, and of course, in, in dance, there's so many genres at this point. I know. So it's... Um, it, it makes it fun, um, but it and but yeah, they they definitely will cross over. Are you going to get into any dubstep or any crazy stuff like that? I have a few dubstep out there. So. Nice. I love it. <laughs> dubstep son, is also one of my favorites. So, my son showed me dubstep probably nine years ago because I'm right into dance music. I like everything, but I love dance music, and uh, he's like, "Check out this stuff, mom," and I was like. I'm just trying to like picture myself trying to dance to dubstep and I'm like, yeah, I guess it could happen, but. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Always. You can, you know, one thing about dance music I find is that especially in Europe, they dance to everything, even if it's, you know, below 120 BPM, they're still there. They're, they're going to dance. Next song. <laughs> Don't give me no. I like it. So that one I released um, last, uh, I guess it was last June or July. I uh, am also a aerial dancer. And so I was able to convince my, um, my other dance mates to be in this music video with me. They've done a couple of music videos with me, but this one I just, I said, let's just do, you know, kind of gritty floor and because this song was was i wanted it to be a little grittier i wanted it to be not so nice of a love song yeah. I, I, it, and it's really about how a woman's gotten frustrated because number one the guy doesn't pay attention he's always on his phone and and she's like you know let's just be real let's just stop the game stop you know going to your dating app stop just stop and i just don't want to hear it anymore and uh so it was meant to be a little bit on the nastier side. We shot the thing in um, the music video in black and white. We had some great um, drone footage that we did in Miami and, and we uh, had everybody, you know, very, very, uh, um, uh, what's the right uh, kind of raw looking, um, not raw, it's not the right word, but, you know, tough, like, tough females yeah you know very the dancing was very like cha-cha you know it was it was but that was a very fun it did very well at the clubs at the time because i think people were kind of still angry about being locked up in covid and stuff so it kind of hit a lot of the great nerves we did very well on a lot of the dance charts just because of that so it was a it was a fun song to do did you pivot a lot during covid were you worried at all like were you wondering what is going to happen to my career you know, because you um, dabble in a lot of things, not, you know, with film and, you know, obviously singing and songwriting and. I mean, you know, as you know, the industry, the entertainment industry just got crushed. Um, it was a very, very challenging uh, time. And, you know, I never thought I would miss performing so much. You know, I did a couple of the virtual concerts, but it's. And you do that just to do something, but it, it's not the same, you know, you don't have the same interaction with your, your bandmates. You don't have the same interaction with the crowd. You don't, you're not experimenting. You're not, you're not really honing in on your, your, um, on your stage skills that you're just missing a lot of things. And, you know, you, you kept thinking, okay, maybe in, in three more months, it's going to be over. No. Oh, wait, three more months is good. Oh, three more, you know, and, we, and time would just go. And you just thought, wow, how, how did we just go through two years of this? How did that yeah. happen? But, um, you know, now it's nice. I see everyone is out on tour. I've been able to do shows in the last year. Uh, and you could see everybody's happy again, you know, on the music side. They're just happy. They're happy to be out. They're happy to be on stage. They're happy to show their new material. There was a lot of writing that went on. And so it, it's it's nice to finally see that. Yeah. 
Did, so you didn't get to see your bandmates? Like, do they all live in Miami as well? Or are they all over the world? They're all over the place. So no, I didn't get to see anybody. It was, you know, it was uh, sad, lonely, but you know, what can you do? So do you have somebody that is somebody that you go to besides like a manager? Is there somebody in your life that you're like, I want to go show this person before I actually go and share that with, with the people that I'm supposed to share it with? Yeah, I have a couple of um, what I would say trusted um, songwriters slash producers that I like to, that I respect them enough that they will be, I mean, I don't need anybody to tell, oh, this is a great song. You know, no, tell me if it's crap, then let me yeah. fix it. Yeah, so I have a couple of those that I know will be very, very um, honest and direct with me. So I, I do appreciate that. And so, yeah, I, with, I never release a song without it going through a couple of people because you can't really listen to your own work and know if it's um, good or not, <laughs> yeah, or, or it, it, it's not so much good, but if it's missing something, because a lot of times your ears get dull, you think you've heard something in it and it's really not there or vice versa, or you, and so it's just like, it's bad to edit your own work. If you're a writer, you know, you think it reads, you can even read it out loud and you think all of the words are there and you still have a misspelling, right? Because you just, you, you want to, you know what your mind wants it to say, but it doesn't necessarily always translate that way in paper. Yeah. So you've traveled the world. Has there been a, a place that you've been where they have went over and beyond to cater to you or take care of you? Is there a place that stands out? Um, I would say definitely Croatia, uh, definitely China. Um, Ibiza treated me pretty well. Yeah, more, more so internationally than in the U.S., uh, I think the U.S., we're just, we have just have so many musical artists that, you know, they're, they're used to seeing people come in and out. I don't know. We're, we're a yeah. little different culture. So, um, but definitely when I leave the States, I get treated a lot. I'm in St. Bart's, I got treated like a queen. So it's, um, it, I think, um, music is so prevalent and we grow up with music and learn music at such early ages here in the States that we, we probably take it for granted. Whereas when you leave, especially in Europe, where it starts a little bit later for them, I think they're, they treasure it a little bit more. They, they respect it a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like, you're not a dime, you know, you're not a dime a dozen. It's not like, okay, who's the next act? Yeah. This is the act. This is awesome. This is incredible. Yeah experience you ever gotten any trouble while you've been on the road oh we always get in trouble I mean <laughs> but you know the thing about shows is I don't know how but it's 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 a mystery there's a great um there's a great movie a long, a long time ago and and you know the, the theater's crumbling and the actors quit and all this stuff and somebody says how are you going to be able to put on the show tonight and, and the guy says I don't know but it's a mystery. It will happen. And that's really what happens. We've, I've had a couple of shows where we traveled, um, via car. This was in, uh, like the middle of nowhere in Maryland. And so we were about two hours away from anything. It was like this country club and a big, huge golf resort, but it was like out in the middle of nowhere. And my, <laughs> my sound engineer looks at me and says, I forgot the soundboard. <laughs> And, and, and we all just went, what? I mean, you, you did what? So we had to, but you know, it, it worked, it all worked out because even in the middle of nowhere, I said, before you have a heart attack, I'll go ask the club. And I said, somebody has got to have a cousin or sister who's a music junkie who will have some little teeny soundboard that will make do to make this gig work. And sure enough, it was like, somebody's cousin's sister about five miles away drove in let us borrow it was a, a you know it was probably this big um had like um 
three channels on it, but we made it work. And so we took our show and turned it into an acoustic um, platform and, and there we went, we, we did it. And so it, it worked out. So the show always goes on despite what ha happens. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just the way it works out. Have you ever had to go and perform and maybe got some bad news or something happened that you had to go perform no matter what, regardless of what was going on? I don't think so. I think I've been lucky in that regard. Um, we were, we've mainly just had instances where, you know, when we were in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, we had a huge tour bus and the bus took, it was, you know, those streets are very narrow and tried to take a turn and it had just been raining and got stuck in the mud. And we were, we were not far from the gig. I would say we were, um, maybe a mile from the gig, but we had all our, in our instruments, right? And so we couldn't wait for him to be towed. So I said, okay, grab what you can. We'll go there and hope they have like a piano since we can't take the keyboard, it's too heavy. And we'll, we'll just make it work. And so we walked a mile with whatever we could carry set up again it ended up being um, a, a very fun you know acoustic they had this old piano i don't know it was somewhat tuned and and it was just fun um but we always make it work um but i don't think we've had anything that was the closest bad news i had which was oh my gosh you know we might miss this gig and i've never missed a gig that's just just not something i ever want to do i'll make it work but i don't want to miss a gig <laughs> That's a good thing. Your fans love you for that. All right. Next. I hope so. So did you play this song in Ibiza? We did. Um, no, it wasn't. Um, I had just wrote that one. So that one came out um, end of uh, this past summer. And so, no, I didn't get a chance to perform that one, but I performed it in South by Southwest this year. So it did make a, and that was, it's a fun song to, to perform. It's a fun, it's just a, um, uplifting, you know, you can't not dance. I remember we were at the, the top of this one club, um, performing in South by Southwest in March. And it was in the afternoon which I always thought was funny that they put a dance artist in the afternoon, but I was like, oh, yeah, whatever, let's see what happens. And let me tell you, the place went crazy because they were, oh, great, we get to dance now. So it was, um, it, it made me smile. It definitely made me smile. Do you have any useless talents, Kim? Hmm, <clears throat> useless talents, wow. Well, I mean, I guess aerial dancing is not that useful. It's, it's a lot of fun, but I'm not sure what, what you do with it besides uh, perform fun tricks. <laughs> so are you like beginner level, immediate? I would say I'm immediate to medium to inner to, um, to advanced. I do do shows. So oh, wow. I keep my shows um, to where I'm comfortable doing them. I do both hammock and pole. I'm definitely more comfortable on the hammock than I am on pole, even though I've done pole much longer. Uh, I just, um, you know, the pole is a, is a scary little animal, but, um, and I get more hurt on pole. I haven't ever hurt myself on hammock yet. <laughs> What's the most riskiest trick that you can do that scares you? Well, I mean, there it's, it's all about lack of body touching the pole. So if, I'm doing a trick that you're in an inverted position and I only have my leg holding me up. It's obviously, you know, not as um, uh, safe feeling as when you get to use your hands. So those are, those are that in itself as a static hold is nothing. It's when you're getting in and out of those positions that it becomes pretty scary. What's your favorite song to perform? Um, Well, it might be my newest one, uh, but I haven't performed it yet. So I'm a part, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that really loves 
new material, I get bored very easily. So I gravitate towards all these like new songs and I like to perform those, even though, you know, it, there's a lot of people who like my old stuff. So I, I do try to mix it in into different sets, but yeah. um, it's <clears throat> the, the songs that I love the most are probably the most challenging to perform live. Um, but the songs that are easiest to perform, I'm the most relaxed on stage. So I, it took me years to figure out to stack it that way than the other, the reverse. Is that how you pick your, your set? Like how uh, you pick your I set? pick it two different ways. I pick, um, sets based on what the venue is, what time the afternoon, um, where I'm fit into the lineup. And I pick it based on how well I perform those songs live. So there's like a, and I have a, you know, 400 songs now. So I, I definitely have some material to choose from, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, with anything, it's, it's a, it's a lot of rehearsals because you forget some of the lyrics and you forget, oh yeah, that's right. That, you know, that's the best way to perform this or that. Or that. So it, it's in front of every you know, festival, I'll have a good month of, of rehearsals I'll do before I go on stage. Do you incorporate anybody else's songs? Like, is there? Oh yeah, for sure. Who's just, somebody that you love? Too much of me is too much of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love when artists do that. I don't expect them to sing it exactly like the other artists, but I do love that other artists do that. Yeah. My favorite is I've just incorporated, um, uh, Fleetwood Mac into oh. um, into the set. I do sometimes. I'll do anything but the girl. That's fun. Um, I've done Madonna before. Let's see. I'm trying to think of some others. Um, I'll do um, uh, some some film track songs from uh, from Devil Wears Prada. Um, I'll do. Um, superstitious sometimes so speaking of yeah, Prada, uh, are you a big shoe girl or do you collect anything bags shoes I love shoes I would say I'm a medium shoe no I mean I would collect more shoes if I had more room to put the shoes but how many shoes um, would you say you have I have a lot I <laughs> I have to be honest, I have a lot, <laughs> but I would have more if I had room. <laughs> Nobody needs as many shoes as I have right now. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with a pretty pair of shoes. That's right. There is nothing wrong. Next song. Now you're mine. What's your story behind that song? That was Billboard Top 20. So, um, you know, when, again, that was more of on the um, women's empowerment kind of song. So less about, uh, there's really not a love story there, but it was uh, about women breaking glass ceilings. And, you know, don't tell me that I'm not capable of doing something. Don't tell me that I don't have the strength to do something. It was really, I wanted to show people, you know, we have a strength as women that is very unique and don't ever discount that because if you do, you're going to, you're going to be surprised and, and maybe not in a good way if you really discounted us in the wrong way. So it's a, it's one of my only women in empowerment songs. I love it. It's a great song. I was excited just to kind of reach out while I listened to your music before I reached out to you. And uh, I was like, oh, this is going to be so, if she says yes, it's going to be awesome. I was <laughs> excited. What has been the best piece of advice that you've been given during your career? My best piece that was given to me and that I give to everybody else, which is, you know, you just don't give up. It's very easy to give up because there's, a, you know, first of all, the competition is huge and everybody's doing the same thing. And so you know, you think, oh, well, if I get this song done, I put it out there, all of a sudden everybody's going to buy it and, and it's going to chart and all these things. And it doesn't work that way. Um, it, there's, 
music is a business. And so there's the creative side and then there's the business side, which is, well, you need to do your homework. You need to promote it. You need to come up with your branding strategy. You need to promote it again. You need, you know, and most artists, and I'm one of them, don't like to do the promotion. It's, it's boring. It's dull. It's nothing. There's nothing fun about it. But unless you want to do songs and just listen to them in your house, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's it. And, and I don't know of any songwriters, you know, true songwriters that don't want to share their music. They, they're dying to share their music. They're dying to hear what people say. Well, what do you think about it? What do you, you know? Um, so it, it's, and they're, they're looking for accolades, but they want honest accolades as well. So it's one of those where I say, you know, just keep going. You're not going to write great songs every time, but keep going. And if people didn't really like that song and they thought it was okay, that's all right keep the song, don't throw it away, go to the next song. I have songs that I did um, on the first album and I thought, well, the production is great, but my songwriting was kind of, eh, it was, you know, it was okay. And those songs do well in film placements. And I would have never guessed they would have done well because I don't think they're great songs, but in, in certain scenes, you don't know what they want. You don't know what a music supervisor wants. And, and they're not looking necessarily for some catchy songs. They're looking for a song that matches the mood of the scene. So then your song has a totally different purpose to it. Yeah. And so you just don't, you just can't predict the future. And, and my song, it's, what's funny is my first album is like doing this underground resurgence because I see it now popping up all over the, um, college radio stations. And I, I'm scratching my head and I'm like, how did that happen? And that was this year. And that that's from 2008. So you just don't know. You don't know. And it's, yeah, I love that you said that because you don't know. I even look at even podcasting, you know, they say like a million or 2 million people start a podcast a year and then like 90% of them quitting six months in. It's like, but they're, the sad part is, is most of those people are quitting because they think that they don't have enough downloads. They think that they don't have enough likes. They think that they don't have enough followers. And what they don't understand is just doesn't happen overnight. And it's okay for however long, if you love doing it, who cares? That's like, right. There always have to be an end destination. That's the part I don't like. It's like, well, I'm going to be a singer for six months. No, if you're going to be a singer, just be a singer. Yeah. Right. If that's what you want to do forever, then just do it forever. Yeah. Do you remember what your high school graduation song was? Wow. No, I don't. I don't think they had, I want to say it was more orchestral in, uh, in nature. Um, it definitely wasn't anything fun. I would have remembered that. <laughs> I was asking that because I was grocery shopping <laughs> today and they were playing my high school graduation. It was the scorpions wind of change and i was like is this oh you had a yeah we really have happening right now this is kind of weird that's cool though you had a cool song we just <laughs> we definitely we had some instrumental song it was not it, there was nothing hip about anything that was played at our graduation <laughs> <laughs> do you remember your very first concert oh yeah adamant oh and he wow. took off his clothes that was so cool wow do you remember that? Like when he would go on, that was why all the girls went because they heard he took off his clothes and sure enough. <laughs> and I was as happy as can be because I was like, I don't know, 15 or 16 or something, maybe 15. And here's this guy taking off his clothes. Now, when you really think about it, Adam and Aunt taking off his clothes, he was like this skinny little kid, right? And only a 15 year old would think that was super sexy because I, you know, he was like, teeny 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 um but I was we were oh my gosh Adam man you know <laughs> did you have lots of teen did you um buy the magazines like the teen beat and all of that kind of stuff rock man of course of course do you remember what your your favorite poster was on your wall growing up yes Sean Cassidy no way really oh yeah I That's had a so huge funny. crush on Sean Cassidy so Just ginormous my parents bought me like a record player, like in a case, it was like massive. And my first album <laughs> was Sean Cassidy. 
So I like went upstairs, they were like yelling at me, hey, go turn the, your music down. And this is what their surprise was, was this really cool stereo. And I've never even heard Sean Cassidy. I was like floored by it. But anyways, I just remember the album opening it up and he was like seductively yeah. laying there. And I'm like, yeah. who is oh, yeah. that guy? Right, so I remember pinning that album like up to on my wall. So I had like half my room, all metal, and then my other half all like team beat, like Kurt Cameron and all these oh, yeah. people out there. <laughs> Sean Cassidy, and we would play, I mean, talk about diverse um, music taste. My girlfriend and I, we loved Sean Cassidy. And then the very next step, we would be putting on our Kiss album. So weird. I was like that too. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> But I love it. And I love that my kids grew up like that, that they weren't just on one genre of music. Yeah. All right. Next song. Not Into You. That also hit Billboard Top 20. And so that was my introduction to Billboard. Um, it, uh, it did phenomenally well. It still does well. It's still out there. It's uh, gets you'll. It's placed on a lot of TV shows. They still grab it. Um, it was. It's definitely one of those raw um, uh, love stories where the girl is basically breaking up with him. You know, just I'm not into you anymore. So it's not that you're not sweet and you're a nice guy and everything. I just don't like you anymore. <laughs> And it just resonated with people, not just the lyrical content, but just that sound. It just hit all the right buttons at the right time. And the um, record did great, it continues to, to do great. So a lot of love songs. I'm, I'm feeling like, have you been through a lot of men here? <laughs> Relationships? <laughs> I've had a few, but What's uh, going on? You no, know, it's just, um, it, it, it speaks from the heart. Yeah. So lots of, you've had lots of heartbreak. Um, I would say I've had enough to write a number of songs about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any pet peeves? Things drive you crazy? I don't think so, actually. That's a great question. I don't, I don't think I have any pet peeves. Um, not yet. There's still time. <laughs> True. How was it performing, um, for the NFL twice. Like how was that experience being asked and then doing that performance? It's, you know, I'm super blessed that this all happened before the Kaepernick because since then it's sort of not the same, right? You just don't know if people are gonna, you know, react or not react. And so I was, I, I got into that beforehand. Um, <clears throat> the first one, what first time was pretty incredible. And that was for the Redskins but it was on um, Christmas Eve and it was mm -hmm. 20 degrees out. And you have to wait on the sideline for half an hour before you start singing. It's just the process. So I was trying so hard not to go like this because then you're, you're, you have to sing. And I was getting the, the, I was so cold and I was shaking beyond belief. And so, um, that was, that was a challenging, very, I, I made it through. It wasn't, <laughs> you know, if I could have done it all over again and just, if they'd just been 10 degrees warmer, it would have made the world of difference to me. Um, but then I, uh, performed for the giants and they, it was one of their first games. So it was in the summer, it's like end of August or something. And I was like, Oh, this is great. So it was like 70 degrees. I got to knock it out of the park. I was super happy about that. Um, and since then, I, I, I've also done the Marlins baseball game, which, you know, each time is very, it's, it's only 90 seconds, right? But it almost feels like an eternity. And it's very raw because you're doing it a cappella. Um, everybody is forced to listen to you and pay attention to you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it, you can't, it's nothing you can hide. Um, you, you gotta do it right. 
uh, the, the, the Marlins was definitely easier than the other two, because I at least lived through the experience twice before. So you do get better as you go along, but you know, they're all, they were also years apart. So it's not exactly, you know, like you, you definitely go through the same nerves and, and the same thing all over again. But, um, I, I, I really do, I hate saying this out loud because it'll probably bring me another one, but I, I really do enjoy doing it. It's, it's a, it's a very incredible feeling. It's an incredible honor. And, um, I, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. It's beautiful actually, because I couldn't imagine it's not like you're performing in front of people that know your stuff. You know, you're singing something that everybody knows and you better sing it right. Else you, if you don't, like, they will let you know. Oh, they will let you know. <laughs> or they'll, they'll tell, you know, it'll be all over social media, which nobody wants that, right? So right. do you remember your first album you ever bought? Hmm. I mean, I've bought so many albums. The first one... Wow. I don't know what my first one is. Your mind? I mean, I had uh, I had quite an album collection by the time I had, you know, hit college. Um <clears throat> I remember when I bought um Talking Heads, but that would I don't think that was my first album. Uh, but I just I had gone to heaven, right? The whole, you know, quasi punk scene, which they weren't. Yeah. Really but I, I, I don't know if it was Talking Heads or the Thompson Twins um, or, um, I'm trying to, or China Crisis. I'm not sure which one I bought first, but, but all of them, I was in that, that great 80s, you know, which was, if you really think about it, it was really dance music, but yeah. they didn't call it dance music then because they wanted it to be their own thing. So they would call it punk, but it wasn't really punk music, <laughs> but that's okay. We'll call it punk just because they wear big outfits and they are, uh, you know, but it, it, it was, it was fun. You know, it was, it was great music. If you think back to the eighties, who was your favorite crush front man? Like the guy that you were like, Oh my God, I love this guy. Oh, oh I know. Helen Oates, my, Gosh, <laughs> oh, no, it's for sure. Yeah, they were magical. They were magical. Both of them. Have you, have you ever seen them? Have you ever seen them? Yes. Yeah. I did get to see them in concert. Um, they're they're amazing. I mean, um, yeah, they, I saw them, and then I want to say about a month later, I got to see Blue Oyster Cult, and it oh, was wow. just like oh, wow, I've got this great summer in, <laughs> you know, scored big time. Yeah, that is. That's amazing. All right, next song. Fallen <laughs> Stars, Wild Boys. So this one is um, probably still one of my favorite songs. I... Um, I have, you know, a deep, uh, I have a relationship element to that, this song, it's a fresh love, but it's, it's just, it's for me, this song hit all the right, you know, lyrics, vibe, feeling all in one, um, and still maintains being a dance song. It uh, did. I did this really fun music video that I I'm an alien who's abducting a guy and taking him back to my uh, my my planet. So that the <laughs> music video was really fun. It's also one of the songs that's extremely hard for me to perform live. So I don't. But it is it is one of my favorite. Do you have any elaborate costumes that you love to wear on stage? I'm all about the glitter. So I have lots of very shiny glittery skirts and dresses that I like to wear. I think it, it's just who I am. I'm a, I'm a glitter person, glitter, nail polish, glitter, makeup, glitter, everything. What about uh, inch heels? Is there a limit? Yeah, I, I, um, 
while I love to have um, very high heels on, when I perform, I find I'm more comfortable if I keep them. I like more to perform in, in, in a nice lower, you know, boot heel. Something's going to stay on me. So when, when I'm walking across stage or crawling over, you know, different cords that I don't have to worry about the cables, tripping on cables and tripping out of my shoes. I mean, I always think it's, it's amazing when I see artists that can perform with the the large heels i it's just really hard for me to do yeah like lady gaga like that's yeah. ridiculous right she must practice for months and months and must must ever have a, a costume malfunction on stage not yet thank goodness no slip nips or anything like that no not yet <laughs> <laughs> do you and your band have a little ritual before you get up on stage do you need quiet time do you need to be separate from people or are you just kind of like rowdy, let's just go? You know, we don't have a ritual. I would say there's a lot of nervous energy. I like to stay standing up so that I can get rid of some of the nerves before stage. Um, and when I really look at the other bandmates, I'd say they probably have the same thing because they're usually standing and we're probably pacing, doing a lot of laughing and, and giggling again, relieving that, that nervous energy before you go. Do you like to drink before stage or sober? I am 100% sober. I can't even imagine drinking on stage because it's just, to me, there's so much going on that I, I, I you know, just that little bit of impairment, I think yeah. I would fear I'd lose something, I'd miss something, forget something, do something not quite as well. Um, now, that as soon as I'm off stage, that, that glass of wine's <laughs> coming, but... <laughs> <laughs> but definitely not during. <laughs> right, next song. Is this a new song, Dancing in the Dark? No, it's not, but it's only a couple years old. And I actually recorded this um, and wrote it in right outside of London with the Wide Boys. Um, the wide, wide, wide boys are very well known in Europe, especially in the UK. They have their own show. Um, they're an amazing duo that that they're just they're just incredible. And they had asked me for about a year, come on, let's do a song together. Come to us, come to us. So I finally said, okay, I'll fly out there. And it was a great experience. We had a lot of fun putting that together. And um, they wanted me, he said, you know, we just feel like, can you write something that is about these people who will just, all of a sudden they'll be in a parking lot and they'll just say, okay, let's just start a rave dance. And it happens at night. And so I said, okay, let's, let's, let's put some together. So it was a lot of fun. Um, another song that did really well. It's still played quite a bit in clubs as well. As well. So there been somebody that you have collaborated with already that was, um, a great, I'm, I'm sure most of the people that you've collaborated have been a great experience, but has there been one that has really stood out for you? Well, um, it wasn't uh, necessarily a collaboration, but um, he did perform on one of my songs is uh, working with Don Randy. So Don Randy, um, he's, I mean, he's still performing. He's probably like 85 now. But he was one of the um, original wrecking crew from the LA era where, you know, he basically did all of the songs for the Beach Boys, Sonny and Cher, you know, Glenn Campbell, I mean, you name it. Like he was, but never got any of the credits because the labels wouldn't until, you know, in the last, you know, 15 years where they went and found all these studio musicians and finally gave them credits. And um, he's, first of all, he's a very, he's a very gentle man. Um, second, he's this, got this incredible musical ear and talent. Um, his, his fingers on, on keyboards and, and piano are, are ridiculous. And I just said, you know, I really, I need to have a Don Randy on one of my songs. I mean, he's a legend. And so that was, um, you know, I've had the pleasure of performing with him Wow, I guess a handful of times now. So he'll invite me to his club and, and ask me to perform with him. And it's just, each time it's just magical. It's just magical. He's just a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. 
I can tell just the way you talk about him. <laughs> yeah, he's That's a great last guy. song. Can you believe it? Your last song already. It's crazy. Time goes by so fast when I'm doing this. Last <laughs> living without me. So this one, I took you into a little bit of a um, R&B flavor. Yeah. Um, I w woke up one day and I was like, you know what? I want to, I just feel like a little sexy R&B song. Um, this song does very well. This is like the song I heard at the, um, at 7-Eleven. That was, it was, <laughs> I mean, millions and millions and millions of radio spins. Um, it's, uh, it's just a great jam. Like, and it, again, classic love song, but it, it's when uh, when you're at that conversation and and the one person says, well, you know, I think I want to like move on and it's been really nice knowing you. And the other one says, look, I'm telling you, you can't live without me. You, you think you can, but you cannot. And it it struck me as this is a this is it's such a sexy, like come back together song. Um, and it just, all the pieces and parts just fit. I love it. So Kim, before I let you go, I'd love for you to leave me some, not me, but you know, the junkie fans, some words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. Well, um, never give up. Stay true to what your heart is telling you to do when it comes to music. Don't ever sway from that. Don't get talked into doing something that doesn't feel natural. Music should never be forced. It should also always feel like it's coming from in your soul. And if you feel like it's coming from your soul, you're doing everything right. Oh, that's great words of wisdom. Now, can you tell us where we can find you, stalk you, admire you, check you out? <laughs> um, I will give you, uh, so my website is kimcameronmusic.com. My Instagram, which I'm pretty good about, is Kim Cameron Music. And let's see, my um, Facebook, I think, is Kim Cameron. Could be Kim Cameron Music as well. But you can pretty much find me that way. YouTube, same way. You can uh, look at the recent music videos since I've released, um, you know, about a half a dozen songs in the last two months. They're all popping up. I love it. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us on Music Junkies today. I had a great time with you. You're so open, easy to talk to, which is nice. I love diving deep into your playlist and getting the backstories behind why you wrote, what those songs mean to you. Please remember everyone to like, follow, and subscribe. Kim Cameron, Music Junkies, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.